Good morning, welcome to God Manifest. Sorry we had some technical difficulties for our new camera. Um, we'll figure it out before the next service. Um, which is, it's time for tithes and offerings. Those who are online, if you want to give, you can go to godmanifest.com forward slash donate. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there who are watching, to all of our friends here and their mothers as well. I just want to tell a quick story about my mother. There's, there's not, it's hard to compare to the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you from my personal experience that the sacrificial love of a mother comes pretty close. My mother, as I explained to you in the past, you've heard the troubles and trials that I've experienced with her growing up, but rarely have I spoke about the, the amazing sacrifices that she made. We grew up very poor, and one thing my mom loves to eat is seafood. We would go out to a Chinese restaurant, order steamed fish, and she'll, she'll peel off the entire side of a filet and give my brother half a filet, give me the other half, and flip the fish and peel off the entire other side of the filet, give it to my father and she'll pick off the bones. That's how broke we were. She sacrificed her favorite food to bless my brother and I and my father and to honor my father while she had scraps. And that to me has shown me that if Christ loves greater than anyone has ever loved, the love that mom showed me there, Christ loved more than that, that's amazing. The sacrificial love. So two weeks ago, I inadvertently started my first sermon series. It was called Kingdom Things. I started two weeks ago with teaching on kingdom culture. And last week, I taught on kingdom nature. Just a lot of things about the kingdom of God and how, and how God, God has implanted in us, impregnated us with his nature, his kingdom, his ways, his calling. So this week, the title is called Kingdom Calling. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ did a lot of things for us. It redeemed us to our Heavenly Father. It restored us into relationship with Him. He washed us clean of all our sins with the blood and the sacrifice. And He gave all believers, you and I, purpose. A purpose in life. Jesus is a man lived a spotless life. And again, I'm saying Jesus is a man because He was 100% man and He was 100% God. But He chose to live as man. To suffer as we suffer, to be tempted as we're tempted, and to have the trials that we have. So Jesus, the man, lived a spotless life, driven, not by not like the rest of us. He was driven not by fear of sin. A lot of us are driven by a fear of sinning. A lot of us are driven by the fear of hell. Jesus was not driven by the fear of hell or sinning. In fact, he was driven by the passionate desire to do his Father's will. And that nature was placed into us at the cross. The life of Christ demonstrated to us a life driven by love. And that a life driven by love cannot be stopped. Because love can conquer all things. So therefore, when you live a life driven by the love of Christ, it cannot be conquered. The things, the way that you live can't be conquered. He also demonstrated that a fear-driven, or I also taught on, that a fear-driven lives will never thrive. If you're saved because of fear, if you're living from fear to fear, if your actions are driven by fear, that won't thrive in the kingdom of heaven. That won't propel you into your calling. That won't, that won't align with God's nature, and that doesn't fit in God's kingdom. Fear does not exist. Because love is always greater than fear. When Jesus also demonstrated his life while he was here alive, how we were supposed to live. He demonstrated how we were supposed to live with his life. He said we were supposed to live passionately, powerful, intentional. We we're supposed to reflect the Father's nature and we we're supposed to reveal the Father's will. Growing up, I used to wonder what my purpose was. And I'm sure a lot of you all have the same thought growing up. What's the purpose of life? What is my purpose? Why am I here? Why am I standing at the podium today speaking? I remember growing up, I experienced a lot of terrible things. A lot of y'all know my testimony of being beaten to death when I was 12. 
of being exposed to pornography when I was three and four. And until I was like into my 20s. By my parents. They exposed me to all this pain, all these trials, all these things. I, we ex experienced extreme poverty. We, my father lost a lot of money through our three different occasions, which forced us to become homeless. We lost everything. We, I had great and influential people speak great things over me and also terrible things. These identities, which I believed because they were influential in my life. However, after salvation, I began to realize and recognize the voice of my Savior, the voice of my God. And God says in Scripture that his sheep knows his voice. And as I became a sheep, I began, began to recognize his voice. And those of you all know that I grew up as a young Buddhist. I was chosen to be a monk at a young age. And from there, when I was in college, just before finding Christ, I was a suicidal college student that, was, that lost his way. Season after season, as I grew up to that point of salvation, all my dreams of who I was supposed to become, who I wanted to become, faded. All my hopes were crushed by the influential people in my life, from teachers to family members to, to friends. And I lost my vision of my future. I remember being drunk, high, or sober, or all of the above, when I was young, back in college, in high school. I remember thinking to myself, there has to be more to life than merely existing. Aimlessly seeking purpose, direction, seeking something worth living for. And when you find those things and realizing none of that satisfied, none of that satisfied the hunger of who I wanted to become, the person I felt like my destiny was supposed to be because I didn't have the creator of destiny speaking to my life at that time. Who am I? Who are you? But why do we and I exist? The world wants to convince us that once our physical lives fade, when we kick our buckets, that that's the end of us. Therefore, if you live by that mentality, the world also wants to convince us that we have to live lives that are self-seeking, indulging in all of our own desires, because self-seeking lives, if, you, if there's no consequence, no consequence, self-seeking will never, you will never receive a punishment. So the world wants to teach you to seek your own desires over the desires of God. They want you to believe that God doesn't exist. A lot of them believe the devil exists, but won't believe that God exists. Believe me, I've walked down that self-seeking road many times before Christ, a few times after Christ. And it always led me to dead ends, emptiness, death, hopelessness, and a life void of a purpose. The world tells us to live entitled, demanding reward for merely showing up. Y'all y'all see this this next this generation rising up at, right after ours. I live, I'm 39 years old. So the generation rising up after ours are, are, are taught that you show up to work, you get paid. You don't get paid for doing your work. You show up for merely. You get paid for merely showing up. This this entitled society is is is, is a cancer to us. It's not kingdom mentality. God says in scripture that a worker is worth his wage. If you're not a worker, you're not worth that wage. And I've been down that road as well with God. What scripture states is that when you wander, that we wander astray from a lack of vision. That's Proverbs 29, 18. And I'm reading from the Passion Translation. It says, when there is no clear prophetic vision, people wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of, of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. In the King James Version, the same scripture, it says, we perish from a lack of vision. Christ came to release his prophetic vision of who we are supposed to be. He released his father's vision and identity into us. He wanted to release who we are, what we are called to do, and how we are supposed to go about doing it. Who are we and what are our purpose? 
Well, according to scriptures, we're, we're ambassadors of God. This means, as ambassadors, it means that every action and every decision that we make either confirms the goodness and love of God or it does not. Todd White, a lot of us really admire him. I'm sure Joe already talked about Todd White to you once or twice. He had a dream. When he came to Houston, he was at the University of Houston speaking. So Olivia and I went over there and he shared a dream that his friend had. His friend said his friend was walking, balancing on a fence. On one side it was the kingdom of God, on the other side it was the kingdom of, of hell, the kingdom of the devil. And he's walking on this fence. And he noticed God sitting there, patient, and the devil smiling. He turns to the devil and he says to the devil, why are you smiling? I'm standing on the fence. And the devil said to him, in this dream, because the fence belongs to me. I'm telling you, the fence will ruin you. The fence is where the lukewarm hang out. The uncertain people hang out and they die. The truth is, why would God allow us to walk on our fence where we have free will? I had a pastor once say to me, he tries to see what he can get away with with God, how far he can push it. I'm telling you, it's dangerous. As you're trying to see what God will let you get away with, God will let you do whatever you want. But not everything you want to do is, is, is godly. Does that make sense? The fence is something you want to run away from. You want to back as far away from the fence so you're no longer lukewarm but burning hot for God. God warns us that if we're lukewarm, he spits us out. He, he, he wants us to either be ice cold or burning hot, not lukewarm. So in second, uh, 1 Corinthians 6.12, it says, It's true that our freedom allows us to do anything. But that doesn't mean that everything we do is good for us. I am free to do as I choose, but I choose to never be enslaved to anything. Meaning testing how much disobedience you can live is a measure of our hearts, our nature, and not God's. Scripture tells us in Philippians 4, 6 through 8. And again, I'm reading from the Passion Translations. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout the day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell Him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. Amen. Todd White's friend's dream was a prophetic warning. That's, that's beautiful. That God will give us warnings in our dreams God will give us warnings in our vision. God will allow us to warn one another on his behalf as a protection onto us. He loves us. And that dream was a prophetic warning that says, get away from the fence as far as you can. So the fence is where the lukewarm are deceived and go and die. And I mentioned that earlier. The fence is where the lukewarm sit there and they think they're safe because they're on the fence. But that dream clearly, I believe it was from God telling us that fence doesn't belong to God. Fence belong to the devil. And again, we are ambassadors. And what does an ambassador mean? According to the dictionary, here are two definitions for the word ambassador. An accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. Number two, a person who acts as a representative or promoter of a specific, specified activity. As, as Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, our specified activity is to represent God, our as accredited diplomats of the kingdom of heaven. When we get saved, our, our identity, our citizenship changes. 
We're no longer of this earth. It says in Scripture, we're no longer of this earth. We're no longer of this world. But we're suddenly citizens and and acquire sonship of God. We're citizens of heaven. John 15, 19 said, Jesus says, he has chosen you and has taken you out of this world to be his. So suddenly, when we receive Christ, we're ripped from this world. But we suddenly belong to God. I remember when I was saved and those people were calling, I held the phone to my chest, afraid, as a Buddhist, afraid of belonging to somebody because I belonged to nothing worthy in my entire life. And I held the phone to my chest and I said, God, if this, if they, this is them calling me, they're missionaries, if this is them calling me, I am yours forever. And it was. They scared me to death. This also means as ambassadors that we are representatives of our Savior, His Father, and His Kingdom in everything we do. Whether we're working in real estate, at home, at home taking care of the house, or working as a marketing director like I do during the day. Whatever we do represents Christ, represents His Father, but who is now our Father and his kingdom, which is also our kingdom, because we have sonship. This means that everything we do is suddenly an extension of the kingdom we claim to represent, of the God we claim to follow, of the Father who saved us, the Son who sacrificed himself for us. All we do represents him. You know what's interesting? Have you noticed that the very moment someone finds out you're a Christian, they begin to hold you at a higher standard. I can tell you, when I was a Buddhist, when they found out I was Buddhist, no one held me at a higher standard. No one said to me, oh my gosh, that is not what Buddha would do. But I can tell you, the moment I became a Christian, everyone looked at me, they began to study, to figure out what, who Christ, what Christ claimed to be. And I can tell you, Christ was. And they want to hold you, they want to hold you to that standard. Some of them are doing it because they honestly hate us. Because we don't belong to them. We're not from the world. Others are doing it because they want to find out if it's true. That a life submitted to Christ, saved, washed clean, can really accomplish and change our hearts. I see that there are two people who are coming. I had friends who looked at me who who mocked me the very moment I became a Christian and said, you are Buddhist, you're a Christian now. And they mocked me as I, as I walked and I tripped and I fell because I had no idea what it was to be a Christian. But as I began to seek God's voice and begin to do as he was telling me, they took notice. Their spiritual ears opened up and they said, I want what you have. It said a lot to me because I, I didn't preach to them. I didn't know how to. I didn't witness to them. I didn't know how to. I just lived my life continual. And I continued to grow. And as I continued to grow, they looked at me and they saw hope that if Jonathan Trong, the sinner, the ex Buddhist, the guy who was in drugs, women, alcohol, who, who name it, I done it, if he can change, there's hope for me. We look at Paul's life, Saul, who became Paul. He's one of the most hopeful lives I've ever seen. A man who murdered and killed Christians and suddenly God used him. If God can use him, God can use me. I remember as a young Christian when I read about the talking donkey, I thought, man, if God can use a donkey, surely he can use me. Surely we as humans and as believers are greater than a donkey. God can speak to you in so many ways and speak out of you in so many ways. But he, when, when, when people look at us, a life that's well-lived, they can see that the kingdom of God is at hand. Heaven has been released. I've also seen believers going after believers in the same way. I've seen them go, you call yourself a Christian? The answer is actually, you call yourself a Christian because you're judging me. I'm not perfect. I'm not Christ. And those who claim to live the perfect life are claiming that they are Christ. But we're we're accredited. We have the sonship of Christ. And we are 
ambassadors of Christ. But we are not Christ. And as Christians are able to give each other mercy and grace, you're going to see that our love for one another is going to reflect to the world what Christians are really about. It says in John 13, 34 to 35, So I give you a new commandment, love each other, just as I have loved you. And this is the words of Jesus Christ. For when you demonstrate the same love I have, I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you are my true followers. When Christians go after Christians, believer after believer, we're basically telling the world, we're not followers of Jesus Christ. We claim to be. Or we're telling the world, man, our actions are representative of Jesus' heart. And we know it's not. My question is, does your do represent your who? Basically, do your, does your actions represent the God you follow? None of us are going to get it perfect. We are called to do as Christ has done, did, and does. And being, having the title of a Christian, little Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, doesn't mean we're perfect. And nor should we present that. It means we have a Savior who loves us, who gives grace, who gives mercy, who guides us, who directs us, who corrects us. Scripture states in John 15, 19, if you were to give your alliance to the world, they would love and welcome you as one of their own. But because you won't align yourself to their values of the world, the values of the world, they will hate you. I have chosen you and taken you out of the world to be mine. I remember when, as people found out I was a Christian, I was shocked how many people started to hate me. I didn't walk around telling people I was a Christian. But when they asked me one day, when I, they saw me close my eyes and pray over my food, they said, aren't you Buddhist? And I said, I was, until I met the real Christ. And they said, well, you're a hypocrite. You should choose one way and go with it. And I said, I have. I've chosen Jesus. He is my way. He is my truth, and he is my life. I was barely reading scripture at that time, and I went to Bible study after Bible study, and I went to church after church throughout the week to keep myself out of trouble. Because I still have those desires in my heart to go out and do bad. So to avoid those desires, I fed myself with good things. You know, as a believer, when I was a new believer, when I was a new believer, the hardest thing I, I had to figure out was how to forsake the ways of the world, forsake the ways of being a Buddhist, forsake the ways of being a Chinese person, forsake the way of being a man, and embrace being a Christian first. And that as I grew in Christ, I, I learned that the lives, the things that I did that didn't align with God needed to be eliminated. Anything that didn't reflect his, 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 his identity needed to be eliminated. Anything that didn't reflect his, his personality needed to be eliminated. Anything that didn't reflect his love needed to be eliminated. Relationships that didn't, that didn't edify and grow, that I didn't edify and grow them, I, I walked away from. John 14, 12 says, I tell you this timeless truth, a person who follows me in faith Believing in me will do the same mighty miracles that I have done and even greater miracles than these because I will go to my Father. Those are the words of Jesus Christ and that is one of the things that we are called to do. Again, this is called kingdom calling and that is one of our kingdom callings is to do the same mighty miracles Christ has done and even greater miracles than these. We're God for that. A lot of us are so afraid to represent the power of Christ and the love of Christ and the passion of Christ, but we want to represent the, the harshness, the, the, the legalism, the law, opposed to the freedom of the new covenant, the grace and mercy in God. John 14, 12 is our calling of who we're called to be. I recall finding the scripture for the first time. I was a younger Christian. I was saved about a year and I was running my, my graphic design firm at that time. I remember running, it was middle of the night, and I run over to my, 
to my friend and I said, I showed him, I said, hey, read the scripture, DJ. He read it and I said, is this true? And he said, it's true. And I said, why aren't Christians currently doing this? And he says, that's a really good question. I said, what did Jesus do? And he said, go Google it. And as I began to research what Christ did, I began to, to pursue that. Not perfectly. I haven't raised anyone from the dead. But I've seen, I've seen the lame healed. I've seen broken necks healed. I've seen cancer disappear. I've seen legs grow. I've seen headaches disappear. I've, I've heard of amazing things I'm still pursuing. I'm getting, we're, we're getting there. This church has, we've seen, we've seen miracles in this church. We're starting to live as Christ lived. We're starting to do as Christ done. I have found that we're not all, we're not called to be in ministry, but we're called to be, to be a ministry. Your life is a ministry. Your life represents Christ. Your life, the way that you treat somebody can, can save them or ruin them from the understanding of who Jesus is. I can attest to that. When I was a Buddhist, I had so many Christians come to me and try to Bible beat me. Tell me I was going to hell instead of telling me how great God is. Tell you what, when I found out how great God is, I didn't want to do the things that got me that was going to send me to hell. I stopped because I realized my life was to serve him. These things started, to be, started fading out of my mind, fading out of my desires. These things, God, God began to replace the desires that I had in my heart with desires that he had for me. We were called to be ministry, not just to be in a ministry. We were called to be ministry. Last week I talked about Saul's amazing conversion. But... As great as Saul was when he became Paul, as great as Peter was, as great as Matthew, Luke, and John were, that is not our potential. Christ came to show us our potential. Our potential is what Christ has done in greater. That is our potential. Peter pursued it. Paul pursued it. Matthew, Luke, and John pursued it. You know, these people pursued it. They were apostles. But we are called to be great, to have to do greater things and Jesus has done, we need to go out and do it. Matthew 10, 8, and then Matthew 28, 18. Matthew 10, 8. You must continually bring healing to the lepers, to those who are sick, and make it your habit to break off demonic presence from people, and raise the dead back to life. Freely you have received the power of the kingdom, so freely you release to others. Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came close to them and said, All the authority of the universe has been given to me. Now wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to be faithful followers, all that I have commanded, commanded of you. And never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. So we are called to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, spiritual and physical dead, we, have you ever met somebody who was spiritually dead? They had no passion, no life. They had no reason to live. I'm telling you, those dry bones will come alive because when you speak the love and the truth of Jesus Christ, you watch light and hope begin to, 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 to burn inside of them. We're called to relentlessly and passionately reveal the love of Christ. As people examine your life, let them find a transparent, humble, and strong person. Let them discover a person who is joyful, grateful, forgiven, a person who, is freely, who freely disperses love, mercy, and grace, which we receive freely. Let them see how God can take a vessel that was beautifully broken. I was a broken vessel. I was crushed from the world by my family, by my friends, by my schools. My dreams were crushed and destroyed. I did not have a reason to live. Let us let the world see how God can take that brokenness and turn you into a new vessel worthy of holding his presence because God lives in you. Suddenly, we went from a, I went from a vessel that was worthless, broken, couldn't hold joy, that I drowned it in alcohol and weed and sex and pornography. When I found out that, wait, this, I'm a vessel that's supposed to hold his presence? God, I'm broken. Fix me. I need help. Let me hold your presence. And when you let when God, when you allow God to hold your, to, to live in you, allow you to hold his presence, he will freely pour you out. And that well will not run dry. He's going to pour you out. 
to the world which you live in. Let your life proclaim loudly without the need of words that God is good, that you are redeemed, that you are strong, and you're doing all this through Christ. That you're, God's good because of Christ. God is, re, you're redeemed because of Christ. You are strong because of Christ. And you're an overcomer because of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I call, you are called to do great things. The greatest thing that we are called to do is represent our living Savior with our lives fully revealing His calling, His nature, and His kingdom. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth, in our lives, in our workplace, in our families, in our hearts, in our actions, as it is already in heaven. And as your pastor, as you watch today, I release that into you, into this house, into every member that, that's part of this church, people who aren't here. You have a, you have a tribal anointing. So as we release that the kingdom, God, the kingdom of God is at hand and is in us. We're releasing heaven to invade your life right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us online and being patient with our technical difficulties. Uh, if you're ever in Houston, you want to visit us, our, our doors open at 1030. We meet in a house. We're a corner house on, off of Chimney Rock. And our service starts exactly at 11 a.m. We we'll hope to see you soon. God bless you all.